We move to letting the law clerks into the courtroom, starting the recording. Now in IT, we can start to broadcast. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 20-5012. Stephen M. Larrabee versus Carlos Del Toro in his official capacity as Secretary of the Navy and United States Appellants. Ms. Barmore for the Appellants, Mr. Vladek for the Appellee. Good morning, Ms. Barmore. Good morning, may it please the court. I'm Cynthia Barmore here for the government. I'd like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal. For about a hundred years, the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve has, by statute, been part of the military and its members have been subject to court-martial jurisdiction. The same has been true for retirees for even longer, who bear many similarities to Fleet Marine Corps Reservists. These decisions are within Congress's Article I authority to organize the armed forces and to make rules for their governance. As the Supreme Court held nearly 200 years ago, in Dines, Congress has Congress may subject persons actually in the armed service to trial by court-martial. And Fleet Marine Corps Reserve members are actually in the armed service, which we know for at least three main reasons. The first is that Congress has made that determination and it is entitled to deference for doing so. The second is that it is consistent with longstanding historical practice. And finally, objective indicia confirm the plain reasonableness of Congress's decision in this area. Can I ask you a question about the first point, please? Um, you mentioned deference, um, but all the cases you cite for uh, judicial deference are cases where the, uh, where the service member involved was already in active service. He's part of the service. He was a member, he was in active service. I don't think any of them involve situations that we face here where the question is, whether someone's in the military service. Your Honor, um, there- Why would the courts, why especially given Toth and cases like it, would, would the courts defer deeply to that question given that there are other constitutional provisions at stake like Article Three and the Fifth and Sixth Amendments? Your Honor, there are a couple of reasons why deference would be appropriate in this area. The first is that not only is Clause 14 at issue, but also Clauses 12 and 13, where the Supreme Court in Perpich emphasized that Congress's uh, power in this area also is plenary and exclusive to both form and organize the armed services in the first instance. And so there is deference that accords to Congress's decision to, in the first instance, define the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve by statute as part of the military. Suppose Congress passed the bill uh, because of, say, a, situa a particular military situation somewhere in the world, you know, there are many, many more uh, contractors and civilian employees working with the military. Suppose Congress decided to subject all civilian employees of the military to, uh, to court martial jurisdiction. Would we defer to that? Your Honor, we don't. Uh, contend that there is an unlimited authority here at issue. But mm -hmm. looking to the Supreme Court's decision in Gualiardo is quite helpful for your question, because in that case, the Supreme Court held that you could not subject civilian employees to court martial jurisdiction. However, in that case, at the end, the Supreme Court did say that Congress could quite easily solve the jurisdictional problem in one of two ways, either by having these civilian employees either voluntarily or uh, non-voluntarily enlist in the military as a formal matter, or by following an ex parte read type procedure, which is what governs paymasters clerks, where they join, um, they are appointed for a permanent tenure until discharged, and they agree in writing to be subject to court martial jurisdiction. And so the first point there suggests that Congress could require 
uh, civilian employees as part of their service abroad with the military to enlist in the military and there wouldn't be a constitutional but, but problem. The question, the, the question you and I are talking about though is the extent of judicial deference and, uh, and, and I, I wanna go back to my original question. Here the question is whether a particular person or a category of persons is, is in the military and, and in, uh, and uh, Toth and subsequent cases say that the courts have a significant role in supervising Congress's decisions in that area, don't they? Well, uh, I think that- In making these de determinations, it says, um, uh, I mean, that's what Toth and the other cases say that, uh, that I, I guess what I, I understand your point that, that we do owe some deference, but I, I just don't, you haven't convinced me that, that the courts have no role here given the serious Article Three and Fifth and Sixth Amendment questions that are at stake. Well, Your Honor, we are not contending that, right? that it has okay. no role. Um, but to get okay. to, I, I think Your Honor's question is getting at whether there is an active duty limitation versus an inactive duty limitation on the approach that we have been proposing. And I would, there really is no limitation that Congress has made rules authority is limited to active duty forces alone. We know that for several reasons. First, you know, Solorio, when the Supreme Court decided Solorio, it discussed how Clause 14 needs to be interpreted according to its plain meaning. And the land and naval forces discussed in Clause 14 is not qualified by their active duty or non-active duty status. Instead, what Solorio said was that military status is what's important. Right. And military status includes being ready to fight wars should the occasion arise, which is equally true for inactive duty troops. Tyler itself, when the Supreme Court decided Tyler in the 1800s, it expressly noted that, quote, qualified relief from active duty did not discharge retirees from their other obligations as part of the military. But, and Ms. Farmer, can, can, I, can, you, can we step back from talking about these cases? And let me just ask you a, a question here. Maybe you could help me in terms of how I think about this case. Um, you, you already said that the question, and I agree with you about this, the question we have to decide, right, is whether, is whether uh, members of the Fleet Marine Corps actually part or members of the armed service, right? That's the question, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And, and that's a question which turns on whether the person has, whether members of the Fleet Marine Corps um, have military duties and are subject to, uh, to military orders, correct? Your Honor. Do you agree about that? Isn't, isn't that what this turns on? Well, what this, what this turns on is, uh, we agree that this case turns on whether the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve is actually part of the military. What no, the Supreme Court said- question, My second question is, that question in turn turns on whether, um, whether they, uh, have military duties and are subject to military orders and discipline, correct? Now, Your Honor, I'm not aware of any court that has announced that particular test. However, if that is the test, the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve satisfies it. And well, so they're really- Well, let's go back to what courts, I mean, McElroy says that, that's the paymaster case. Toth itself says that. They all talk about being part of the military uh, structure, subjecting yourself to military discipline, I guess I'm a little surprised if you don't think that's the standard. That, t tell me, I mean, think about it for a minute. Why, why else does uh, Congress have the authority to allow the military to court-martial its members, right? It's for discipline, correct? It's to discipline the military. That's part of the, that, that's why we allow uh, the military uh, to discipline its members outside of the Article Three courts, right? That's exactly that right. Sure? Okay, so okay, so so, and and in fact, so okay, so then then if we agree on that, and, and you and I can let's set aside our disagreement about deference, okay? Just assume for a minute that I think there is does not quite as much judicial deference as you think there is. So now that we agree on the standard, let me ask you about this case, okay? So. And I want to be sure I'm right about this. As I read the record, members of the uh, Fleet Marine Corps, they don't have any 
specific military duties, right? I mean, and, and I don't see you disagreeing with that in the brief. I mean, you know, they don't have commanding officers. They aren't assigned to specific commands. They can't issue orders. I mean, they don't have any military duties at all. Um, and as you, but you point out in your brief, they're subject to recall, right? Which I want to talk to you about in a minute. And they, they have these other obligations, like keeping their addresses up to date, uh, rules about wearing their uniforms and things like that. And I want to ask you a question about that. How does the military enforce or ensure compliance with those rules? Do you know? There are a variety of different ways the military can enforce rules beyond just court martial jurisdiction. There are, there are sub court martial jurisdiction administrative procedures, which I imagine could be used in that type of situation. Do you know as a practical matter how the, how the, uh, how the core does manage these kinds of obligations, whether they're both the service related, whatever the service related obligations are, wearing their uniforms, uh, 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 keeping their addresses up to date and things like that. Do you, do you know how the military? I am uh, not aware of how the military, if somebody doesn't report their address, I'm not yeah. sure exactly how but they- they don't do, do, do you know, well, let me ask you this question. I actually just don't know the answers to these and it'd be very helpful for me to know. Do you know whether or not, the, do you know whether or not the military ever court martials members of the uh, fleet Marine Corps for violating these kinds of uh, these kinds of duties, these kinds of obligations. For example, not reporting their address. Yeah, right. I'm not aware of any court martial okay. in that type of situation. Yeah. And what about for other quote service? Uh, we let's not get into the debate about service related or not. But for members of the Marine mem members of this uh, of the Fleet Marine Corps, do, do you know whether uh, whether they are um, uh, court martial for uh, uh, other service related infractions like I mean uh, like what about insulting an officer? Well Do you know so for the Flea Marine Corps Reserve specifically mm -hmm. no but this court's decision in Claus and the arms did involve a impertinent letter that a retiree sent <laughs> to his superior officer right. and so that was a court martial for that type of service. Yeah. In of course, that was, a, that was a pre tough case, right? Yes. All right. Okay. So then let me focus in on this then. So, so the only order, the only type of order that, um, uh, that members of the, uh, this core are to is an order to return to active duty, right? That That's is, that it. Is, could you please repeat your question? That's it. That's the order. The, the uh, members of the Marine of the Fleet Marine Corps are subject to one category of order, namely an order to be recalled to active service. Right. Well, setting there, aside the other ones that we've been discussing about, you know, reporting their addresses, for, yeah. drawing their but, pay, which are right, service but, obligations but, this court described as limited but, duties that yeah, would. But those, aren't, those aren't. But those aren't. Those aren't the result of orders, military orders, uh, right? Those are just obligations that they have by being members of this corps. But, but Your Honor, the obligations are no in a sense an order. order. Hmm? Yeah. They are in a sense an order in the sense that there are many military regulations that order compliance with a variety of procedures that you know would count it as an order. I would imagine. Hmm. Well. <laughs> well, assume, just help me for a minute, assume that I think that those are more, you know, regulatory requirements. Uh -huh. that, um, because none of them flow from a military order, uh, the kind of order that I thought you and I agreed is one of the questions we look for to determine whether someone's a member of the military service. Are they subject to military discipline? Uh, so but let, let's assume for a minute that the major order, and you make a you 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 emphasize this in your brief that they're subject to being ordered return to active duty, right? Yes, that is certainly a primary yeah. obligation. So, would it be fair for me to say? So, the question before us is whether that is enough 
it, whether, whether that's enough uh, for Congress to subject uh, the entire, all members of the Fleet Marine Corps to, uh, to, to the poss possibility of court martial, court martial uh, jurisdiction, right? Um, I'm, I'm happy to focus on that duty if you would like to, Your Honor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so looking at just the possibility of recall to active duty, mm -hmm. I would again point this court to its own decision in Quas and the Arms, where it talked about being assignable to duty to the soldier's home as itself a military duty that made retirees in the military, where they were not on active duty in the soldier's home at the time, but they were assignable to that duty. Well, as I said before, you know, we agree, Quas is a pre tough case. And, and we have to, we, and under TOF, the question, isn't the question we have to, don't we have to interpret, don't we have to, I'm almost quoting here from TOF, don't we have to interpret Clause 14 uh, as narrowly as possible to, quote, avoid encroaching on the jurisdiction of Article Three courts? That, that's, Clawson wasn't subject to that. And besides, Clawson wasn't a court-martial case anyway. John, I say I'm out of time. May I answer your no, question? You keep, no, 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 please. You guys, please. Besides, uh, my poor, my colleagues haven't had any chance. <laughs> and I'll bet they have a lot. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, here's what I'm getting. Yeah. Right, right. Here's, so, here's what I'm getting at. Look, here's the core of my question. And, and I, don't think this is, I don't think this is an easy case. I think this is hard. But as I see it, the question is whether the fact that there's that members of the court are subject to an order to recall them to active service is that enough to subject the court to article to court martial jurisdiction when uh, under toth we have an obligation to interpret it narrowly to protect people's rights in the article 3 courts and also um, and also given the fact that we're talking about best i can tell I, this is not in the record but as best I can tell, there's more than two million people uh, who are in the uh, who are retired, <laughs> uh, military, and Toth itself thought the total number of people being brought under military jurisdiction was important. So, so my question is, how do you make the case that 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 order by itself is enough to bring these two million people uh, under court martial supervision? That, that's my question. That's why I Your see Honor, this case. You, you, make, you could make the argument that you could, but I'd like to hear it. Yeah, Your Honor, my, my first reaction is that this language in TOTH is really about what to do when you have civilians being subjected to court martial jurisdiction. TOTH emphasized the civilian nature of discharged service members who are wholly different from other service members who have not been discharged from the military. Mm -hmm. And so the court has recognized that in certain narrow circumstances, it can nevertheless be appropriate to consider somebody not formally in the military to be still in the land and naval forces for purposes of clause 14. But in this type of case where you don't have a civilian at issue, it's not this court's role to strictly evaluate the military necessity of subjecting someone to court martial jurisdiction because mm -hmm. that authority is really granted to Congress to weigh in the first instance. Ms. Oh. Yes, please. I, can, I mean, you had said that um, you said earlier in the argument that Congress's power is not unlimited here. So um, I would be interested to hear from your perspective what the limit is, you know, and how I mean, if the courts are to have some role, which I think you can see they have some role in determining who is in the land and naval forces, then what is that limit precisely? Is it the limit that Judge Tatel suggested? Is it a different limit? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. So we have not in our brief suggested a specific hard limit to govern these edge cases that may arise where the court would have a role and could say that Congress exceeded its authority. And the reason we have two main reasons why we don't think it's appropriate in this case to draw that limit. The first is that in the Supreme Court's decision, and we'd be covert, the Supreme Court was very clear that when confronted with this type of case about the limits of court martial jurisdiction, the court should really only focus on the person before it and the type of person that would be you know, affected by that decision. 
the, you know, the, the plurality said that it would not precisely define the boundary between civilians and members of the land and naval forces. And then Justice Frankfurter in concurrence said basically the same thing and said that he would only judge what had been enacted and what was at issue. And so for in this kind of area, I wouldn't want to get ahead of Congress not knowing what kind of military exigency could justify a particular exercise of court martial jurisdiction in the future. So is that a suggestion that we can only decide this case as applied to Mr. Larrabee or, and that we shouldn't think about the facial challenge to subjecting all fleet marine reservists to court martial jurisdiction? No, Your Honor, this court's decision I think would govern fleet marine corps reservists generally. Mm -hmm. My only suggestion is that this court doesn't have before it a case that does not involve the fleet marine corps reserve. That might be sort of a sham case where we could come up with really outside hypotheticals that could be at the boundary of Congress's power. But here, this, and this gets to the second reason why there's no need in this case to do so. There's really, under any metric, the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve is part of the military, and reasonably so, both on functional criteria and the formal criteria that we've already discussed. It does seem, though, um, I mean, much of the, the discussion about whether you know, the fleet marine reservists are part of the armed services seems to depend on the fact that Congress has said that they are. And I mean, in other contexts, the court does not usually let Congress define the boundaries of its own power, right? So the court will not defer to Congress's judgment that a certain activity um, is interstate commerce, for instance, right? Um, you know, once the court determines something is interstate commerce, of course, Congress may regulate it. Um, <coughs> in a fairly plenary fashion. But, but you know, that first question um, about whether this is actually the type of thing that's allowed to be regulated, um, I guess I'm not sure. So, in, I mean, in your view, there's just, there's no reason in this case to articulate what the principle is or what the that's limiting a, principle is. That's exactly right, Judge Rao, because here we have a express constitutional provision that does give Congress authority to form and organize the armed services in the first instance. And that itself, is plenary and exclusive and gives Congress at least entitlement to respect from Article Three courts in terms of who is in the military. But again, in this case, where we have so many functional indicia of military status, along with longstanding historical practice, treating retirees as in the military since the 1800s, there really is no reason in this case to draw a hard outer limit or a boundary or try to define a, a, a rule that would govern non-Fleet Marine Corps reservists. So assume I need a limit. What what is what is what is your limit? If if I, I get that you don't think we need to draw a line, but if I think we need to draw a line, what line should we draw? I mean, if I if I were pushed to provide some sort of uh, possible outer limit, I I would imagine that you know Congress could not create a sham component of the armed services, for example. So following the Supreme Court's decision in Reed v. Covert which held that civilian dependents could not be subject to court martial jurisdiction. I don't think Congress could turn around the next day and create a spouse force and make all you know, spouses part of the military with no other action that would be a sham to evade the judicial limits on court martial jurisdiction. How would but again- have, So I, I think I, I agree with, I think that's the test I came into this argument thinking probably makes a lot of sense is, is Congress gets to deem who's in the military, uh, but the, the check on that is it, it can't be, in your words, a sham. That's a good word for it. What's the test for what is a sham? That is a great question, Your Honor, that I think illustrates why this case is so far afield from that and why trying to develop those limits in this you, case is very right. difficult because and we I, just I, haven't needed to brief or develop that type of argument for what would be a sham. And so Ms. I wouldn't want to- Ms. Fairmore, I, I, I understand you don't think we need to answer the question uh, and, may, and maybe we don't. Uh, but, and I won't belabor it beyond just one more attempt. If, if I do think we need a test for what is a sham, do you have a test to propose? I do not at this time have a test to propose, Your Honor. Okay, I, I, I understand that. Okay. What about, uh, I'm sorry, no, you go ahead. Oh, please, 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 Judge. I was just gonna follow up to your question, which is, um, we'll go back to my original hypothetical. Suppose Congress said that all civilian employees of the military are now in the military. Would that pass your sham test or not? Well, historically, every time that Congress has attempted to conscript people into the military, it has created a procedure whereby somebody has to formally 
enlist in the military? No, 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 not a, not a conscription. Just they, they pass a law saying that anybody who's a civilian employee is now a member of the military. So if you decide to be a civilian employee, you're in. You're part of the military. Well, I think so. Two and answers. Subject, subject to court martial jurisdiction. I mean, two responses, how Your Honor. Would, answer, how, would, how, how, would, how would you, uh, this, whatever the standard is that Judge Walker was looking for, how, how would that determine the outcome of that case? Well, I think that particular case would be, you know, a lot of guidance would come from the Supreme Court's decision in Gualiardo, where the Supreme Court did expressly say that there would be no problem with subjecting civilian employees to court martial jurisdiction so long as those employees were made part of the military, either through voluntary or compulsory mm -hmm. induction. Mm -hmm. And so in your hypothetical, it seems that what you're suggesting is that Congress would be formally making those individuals part of the military and that new civilian employees who joined would in fact be enlisting in the military. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court said in Gualiardo, there would be no problem with that. Okay. So is there, so what would be the problem and why would it be a sham for Congress to take the same action with, res, res, with respect to a service member's dependents? Like why, why would that be a sham? Well, Your Honor, in, you know, in that case, would Congress not just say it's necessary and proper to, you know, the government and regulation of the land and naval forces? I mean, once again, Your Honor, I am very wary of getting into these outer hypotheticals just because I don't know what kind of military exigency Congress could be confronting that might change the calculation. But the way that I've been thinking about that type of issue is just that in Reed v. Covert, the Supreme Court recognized that there could be instances where somebody like a civilian dependent or a civilian just generally might be subject to court-martial jurisdiction if they could be fairly considered to be in the military. But it reasoned that civilian dependents had never served in any capacity in the military, had never been in the military. And so in that kind of fairness analysis, which the court also, again, repeated in Kinsella, I think that there would be a concern that there might be a sham type of situation at play. Ms. Barrymore, why do we have a fleet reserve? Why do, why do you think Congress created one? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear Congress created the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve to have this experienced pool of service members who could be recalled to active duty without any need for further training. So they've all served in the military for at least 20 years on active duty. In that respect, they're quite different from a sort of new recruit or most inactive reservists, and they are ready to be deployed in a leadership capacity to draw on their wealth of experience in times of need. Um, and so having that to draw on was, I think, Congress's primary concern. Do you know when um, someone like Staff Sergeant Larrabee would be allowed to wear the uniform before his crime? Yeah, so there, there is a regulation that we cite in our brief that details the circumstances where he could wear his uniform. I, I forget the exact uh, times, that, um, but it is written there. Uh, you can readily pull it up. Uh, is, is, and he's also allowed to sometimes introduce himself as as a Staff Sergeant Larrabee, right? Rather than Mr. Larrabee, right? Yes, Your Honor. Um, so, uh, I, I know we're long on time. So I, I, just, I just have one question that's that, uh, one last question from me. Uh, and it's, it's not, it doesn't go right to the question presented, but it's, it's been on my mind. Do you have a sense of, of why the sentence in this case was so low? eight months for sexually assaulting an unconscious spouse of a Marine recording it? Um, Your Honor, I, his sentence was originally 10 years of confinement. Most of that was obviously uh, suspended. I don't know why it was so low, but I obviously agree the facts of this case are egregious. It, it does actually go a little bit to the question presented in this way. And I wanna ask Mr. Vladek about this too. You know, sexual assault has been uh, a, a blemish for the military. Um, and there's, a, there's certainly a military interest in remedying not just the substance of that, which is most important, but also the image, the reputation, the honor of the armed forces. My understanding from a quick Google search is the military spends something like $600 million a year on public relations. And it's got to be something of a, of a blemish if someone who can refer to himself as a staff sergeant and wear a uniform 
is able to go around doing what he did uh, without the military being able to punish him. Of course, in this case, they didn't punish him very much. Do you think that alone would be a, a sort of sufficient interest for why Congress would have chosen to make the fleet reserve subject to court martial? And Your Honor, the facts of this case illustrate exactly why service members are subject to court martial jurisdiction, where you need to have order and discipline in the military. And when service members sexually assault the, the wives of active duty service members, considering not only just the perpetrator here, but also the victim having a military status, there is ample grounds for Congress to want to uh, retain order and deter this type of crime, absolutely. Thanks. Of course, um, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, I, I mean, implicit in your in your answer, Walker. In fact, you say this in your brief. I think you say that um, that uh, if if this if Larrabee had not been subjected to court martial, he would have escaped prosecution altogether. Um, right? You do say that in your brief, and. Uh, and the Larrabee well, has two responses to that 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 I, that you didn't really deal with in your reply brief that relate to this question. I think Judge Walker is asking you. Um, one of his answers is that Toth and Toth, at least, and Kinsella both reject that argument. But the other one, which relates to this, is that they say look, the military the military tied its own hands here because. By, by determining that Larrabee was a member of the armed forces and therefore ineligible for prosecution under the military extra, extra, extra territorial jurisdiction act. So, you know, there's a way to solve this problem for the military. And that is if they're not, if, he's not, if a person like this is not the member of the service, he can be prosecuted, can't he? In the article three courts under the military extra territorial jurisdiction act, right? Your Honor, in all likelihood, somebody in Mr. Larrabee's situation right. would be subject to prosecution under right. MEJA. I would point out that MEJA yeah. only covers felony offenses. And so if somebody were to shoplift less than $1,000 at the commissary, they would not be subject to prosecution. But under Congress, Congress can change that if it needs to. I mean, that's what Toth and, and the other cases say. They say, look, Congress has control over this, right? They Congress can, if Congress can't, uh, can't, uh, uh, provide that uh, people like uh, Larrabee are subject to court martial, it can provide that they're subject to punishment under other procedures, the article courts, and it doesn't have to limit it to felonies, correct? It's so we don't have an either or situation here, right? That is true, Your Honor, but what the Supreme Court has also said is that the choice of forum, whether a federal court or court martial to be tried in is not given to the service member. And similarly, this court has only evaluated this type of military necessity in the civilian cases. In the service member cases where somebody is in the service, the court has recognized that Congress has a need to create a separate and distinct system of military justice to ensure discipline and order in the military. Right. And that is exactly what we have here. Okay. I just have two fact questions for you. Number one is, do you know how many people there are in the uh, fleet? Uh, Marine Corps? I do not, Your Honor. I just tried to find that out. Um, I think the, res the reserve itself has about 35,000 maybe, um, but I don't know how many are in the fleet Marine Corps reserve. And you don't, and the other services, Army, Navy, uh, I'm sorry, the Army, the Navy, and I assume the Air Force, they have comparable organizations, right? No, Your Honor. So this particular oh. type of 20 year service is only in the Marine Corps and in the Navy. The Army and the Air Force do not have a similar 20 year fleet. I, I would, I think we'd appreciate if you could let us know. Did, did you say you tried to find out and couldn't? We don't, we just don't know the answer to this question. Oh, no, I, I'm sure I could. I just briefly would you, tried to, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Would you let us know? Here's my last question. Am I right that whatever we decide here with respect to the fleet Marine Corps will? will control all the, the entire military retiree population. That, that this, this is a question of how retirees are treated. 
correct? Your Honor, we think that retirees are equally subject to court martial jurisdiction, but oh, this court is only, but not necessarily, I, I, depending on how this court writes the decision, mm -hmm. the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve is the only thing before it, and they are subject to active duty recall under a broader set of circumstances than retirees. Oh, I see. Okay, that's helpful. That's helpful. Okay. Um, well, unless Judge Rao, Judge Walker, do you have anything else? Not for me. Okay. Why don't we hear from Mr. Flaherty and Ms. Barmer? We'll give you some extra time. Okay. We used up Thanks. all your <laughs> other time. Your Honors, may it please the court, good morning. Uh, Steve Vladek representing uh, the plaintiff appellee, Stephen Larrabee. So I'd like to actually pick up where Your Honors questioning left off um, with regard to the implications of the government's position. Uh, Ms. Barmore, I think quite assiduously tried to avoid discussing what she referred to as the boundary cases. I wanna suggest that that actually isn't something this court can avoid, um, that under the government's position in this case, nothing would stop the government from court-martialing a 90-year-old uh, Korean War veteran who retired after being injured in the war um, for shoplifting a newspaper from his local supermarket. Nothing would stop the government from court-martialing a veteran of the war in Afghanistan who retired after 20 years of distinguished service um, and publicly criticized the controversial withdrawal from Afghanistan earlier this year. Indeed, Article 88 would specifically authorize court-martial of that individual for using contemptuous words toward the president, the secretary of defense, or any number of other executive officials. Um, and that's just under existing statutes. On the government's theory of deference, nothing would stop Congress from going further and from subjecting to constant court martial jurisdiction anyone and everyone who Congress deems to be in the military. Because Mr. once, Hunter, I'm sorry, Judge. Could, could you elaborate on your test for the boundary cases or as, uh, as Ms. Bearmore called, called them, the, the, the sham cases? So, I mean, I, I, with respect to Judge Walker, I don't actually think a sham is the right way to think about it. Um, you know, we don't dispute that Congress has a lot of control here. The control Congress exercises, and this goes to one of Judge Tatel's questions to opposing counsel, is what kinds of duties um, does the individual have at the moment they're subject to court martial? Um, and so this is why we think it's so critical that retirees, members of the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve have none. Uh, because, Judge Walker, there could be close cases. Um, inactive reservists, for example, might pose close cases. Um, but here, there are no training obligations. There are no maintenance obligations. There are no fitness obligations. Why, Mr. Blair, I, I, why, is that? why is that the test? What's the case for why that should be the test? So I, I think there are multiple cases, Judge Walker. I think it's not just Toth. I think it's Toth covered. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean literally court oh. cases. I mean, what's the argument for why that's the test? I'm sorry. Um, so I think the argument for why that's the test is because from those cases that I referred to, um, the Supreme Court has said that the question is whether the individual in question, to quote Singleton, can be regarded as actually falling in the land of naval forces. Um, and the question, of course, is can be regarded by whom? And it seems to me that this court has two choices. Um, choice number one is to say can be regarded by Congress at which point we are ceding an enormous amount of power to the legislature. And I don't know how you could impose a sham limit if can be regarded as deferring to Congress or can be regarded as actually falling in the land of naval forces by those whose job it is to interpret Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14, i.e. the courts. Um, and in that context, Judge Walker, it seems to me that courts could still show deference to Congress by giving Congress the benefit of the doubt but that deference has to be about the actual functions these individuals are tasked with performing and not just the label Congress places on them. So Do you think he could be- Mr. Fladek? Oh, sorry. No, please, Judge. Oh, um, I guess I'm not sure. So in your, um, in your understanding, if someone is an active service member, then this is just automatically met your standard. So I, I think it's actually not just mine, Judge Rao. I think that's Solorio. I mean, I think the you know the the there's no way to me to read Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion in Solorio suggesting that there's room for doubt once you have active active duty service members. And so, where um, I guess why should we think of inactive service members under a functional test, right? So if if active if active duty members are certainly included you know, um, Congress has the authority to organize the armed forces as it chooses, including keeping some people in reserve or retired status. Um, 
you know, why does that category of, of persons automatically, why are they applied? You know, why do we, why should we apply a functional test to that group? So if I may, and I apologize if I misspoke, I don't think that Solorio is formalist. I think Solorio is recognizing that if you are in active service, you are at every moment of your life functionally subject to plenary military control. You are subject to orders. You can give orders. Um, you are constantly subject to being moved around, to being reassigned, as opposed to inactive personnel. And, and Judge Rao, I think this is where we get into something the government really doesn't address in any detail, which is why retirees are the only inactive personnel who are subject to court-martial. Because if we actually look at how Congress and the Department of Defense have structured the government's priorities for who it's going to rely upon when it needs reserve uh, supplemental manpower. Um, the retirees are at the bottom, um, right? The, the ready reserve is the primary, the principal, the, 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 the favored body of additional manpower. And yet none of them are subject to court martial when they're inactive. Um, even though they are subject to training requirements, even though they can be subject to drug screening if they're in the Marine Corps. So Judge Rao, it's not that we think it's one test for one category and one test for another. It's that we think there are features of active service that necessarily satisfy the test. Then why does that not bring us back to O'Callaghan's test, that mm -hmm. there has to be some type of service connection? If you're saying even an active duty service member, um, you know, we think about that in a functional way, you know, whether or not they're within the land and naval forces, then why does that not return us to O'Callaghan, which of course was, which of course was reversed by the Supreme Court? Yeah, I mean, so, the, you know, the government, I think, uh, criticizes us for trying to bring back O'Callaghan. We're not, um, right? That O'Callaghan, I think, was misguided in thinking that active duty personnel somehow take off their uniforms when they go home at night. Um, right, And that was the point of Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion in Solorio, was to say that's just not true in practice, it's just not true in application. Um, right, That if you are an active duty service member, you are always on, even when you're not on the battlefield on the front line. Matic, though, is your principle different from O'Callaghan, is, or is just your application of the principle different? In the so I, think, I think our principle is different, Judge Rao, because we don't think the question is whether the offense is service connected. We don't think that court martial jurisdiction in the first instance turns on the substance of the offense. It turns on the relationship of the offender to the military. Again, to quote Singleton, a on the military status. Of, I'm sorry. Service connection. I mean, you know, isn't that what your test boils down to? But I, I don't. So, Judge Rao, I don't believe so. And here's why. Um, the service connection test, as articulated by Justice Douglas and O'Callaghan, was about the conduct. It was about whether the specific offense for which the service member was being court-martialed had a nexus to the military. Um, we're not, our primary submission before this court has nothing to do with the relationship between Mr. Larrabee's offenses and the military, and everything to do with the fact that when those offenses were committed, Mr. Larrabee himself had no relationship to the military. That's not service Oops. connection on the offense yeah. side, Your Honor. That's about whether he is functionally subject to orders at the time the okay. military is exerting jurisdiction over him. All right, and, I, I, and I, I understand that. The service connection, that was a backup argument. Your main argument is members of the fleet uh, reserve corps here are not members of the military. What's your, what's your answer to um, the government's argument that, uh, and they're not members, and the test is whether they're subject, whether they have military duties and are subject to orders, and the government says, well, they are subject to an order to be recalled. What's your answer to that? I, you know, Judge Chato, from our perspective, that actually proves, uh, proves our point. They're subject uh -huh. to exactly one order, um, one order. Uh -huh. as opposed to, as opposed to um, reservists who are subject to a far wider range of orders. Reservists mm -hmm. can be ordered to training while they are inactive. That's the whole point of inactive duty training. Um, the only order that can be issued to my client that he is bound to obey is an order to recall. And Judge Chato, to go back to your question to opposing counsel, um, in Bagani, the, the parallel case, in the Navy Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals, um, Chief Judge Crisfield, in his dissent, in footnote one of his dissent, which your honors will find at page 787 of 79 MJ, um, Judge Shadle, Chief Judge Crisfield went out of his way to point out that none of the regulatory obligations the government has highlighted, including keeping the government apprised of a mailing address, um, come with any consequences for being violated. That is to say that Mr. Larrabee could not be court-martialed if he simply failed to keep the government apprised of his current mailing address. Are there, are there any 
other, I hate to use the word service related because I don't want to get you back into your backup argument, but are there other uh, behavior, other th- offenses that members of the Fleet Marine Corps can commit beyond not notifying the, uh, the department of, of their dress or wearing their uh, uniform improperly? Are, so, there, are there offenses for, that they, for which they can be court-martialed? Like, what about, I use the example of disrespecting an officer or there must be other things like that, right? What happens to them? So, Judge Chato, the, the government's mm-hmm. position is that any offense prescribed by the UCMJ, um, including the use of contemptuous words toward an officer, which is Article 88. Right. But do you, my question is, as a practical matter, yeah. do you know whether these people are court-martialed for that sort of behavior? The, you know, so let me start from the from the from the I think relatively important baseline that we haven't seen that many of these cases until recently. Um, and mm-hmm. Judge Tatel, the ones I'm familiar with do not involve those kinds of offenses. Um, if I might, the government does point out what do they what do they involve? What kinds? Do, what what kind of cases do you see? Um, I think they are typically. I mean, the this is going to be a bit uncouth, but the the sort of the core of of most court martials these days are drug offenses sex offenses and child pornography offenses. And I think that's been the consistent theme of these cases as well, um, which does bring me back. I do want to get back to Judge Walker's question to opposing counsel. But but Judge Tatel, on the on the what can a retiree do to actually earn the wrath of the military? I mean, the government at one point points to the ban on foreign employment um, as an example. But of course, your honors, that actually, I think, undercuts the government's position in two respects. First, that ban applies to everybody who has been an executive branch employee, including civilians. And in fact, 18 USC section 207, the ban, specifically exempts retired military officers from at least some of the prohibitions. So, you know, I think the relevant point is that Congress does not specially treat retirees or members of the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve as if they're uniquely subject to military discipline as retirees. The government's position is just that they're subject to military discipline because they're not any different from active duty service members. And that's why, from our perspective, your honors, the government's position is so limitless. Um, That's why the 90-year-old Korean War veteran can be court-martialed for shoplifting um, on the government's theory under the laws it stands today. Under your theory, could a fleet reservist be court-martialed for conduct he commits while wearing his uniform? While wearing his uniform, Judge Walker, no, because he's still retired. And if I may, the the uniform regulation about which the government makes so much um, is actually worded very carefully to disallow, to to prohibit wearing the uniform in contexts in which the wearing of the uniform might convey that the person is acting with military authority. Um, It's it's meant to be ceremonial. When can he, when, so, so ceremonies is the answer to when he can wear a uniform? Um, I mean, I, the, we, we cite the relevant regulation in our brief, Judge Walker, the government does as well. I believe we excerpt some of it in the appendix to our brief. Um, Judge Walker, the short version is ceremonial occasions, retirement ceremonies for colleagues, promotion ceremonies, um, but in no context in which it's supposed to be allowed to convey any substantive authority. Okay, let me ask two questions about precedent. And I, I, I think the answer to both of them are no, but I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Uh, Are there any cases in which a court told Congress that it incorrectly defined someone as a as a service member? Uh, I am not aware of a case like that, Judge Walker. I will just say, if I may, um, there are two cases that we cite in our brief, one in the Court of Military Appeals and one from the Ninth Circuit, where the courts noted that there would be serious constitutional questions if an individual who was a reservist was tried for offenses committed while he was fully inactive as opposed to while he was on inactive duty training. That's, I appreciate that. And then the second question about precedent, are there any still governing cases in which a court deemed someone a service member at the time of both the offense and the service member's trial, but then prohibited that service member from being court-martialed? On jurisdictional grounds, Your Honor. Right. Defense right. and the time of trial. Um, there is the short answer, Your Honor, is yes, but it's a little technical. Um, the so Your Honor might be familiar with the Hennis case um, on the Army side, where there was a question about a now a now defunct old version of Article Three of the UCMJ, 
Um, which so let, let me back up a second, Judge Walker. And I, I apologize for getting into the weeds. Um, there is a category of offenses, Your Honors, which actually I think are relevant to this discussion, where a service member has a break in their service. Um, let's say between multiple tours, um, and the law has always been that the service member cannot be tried for offenses committed during the break. Um, Judge Walker, there was until I believe 1990 or 1992 um, statutory constraints on the ability to try a pre-break offense, post-break, that still apply to pre-1992 offenses, but is no longer enforced. So I, I'm sorry for giving such a technical, weedsy answer to your question. No, it's, 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 it's helpful. And uh, no, I heard someone else jump but in. Can I, if, if I might just, oh, I'm sorry, no, just- no, no, finish your answer to Judge Walker. If I, if I might just extrapolate from that, though, yeah. I, mean, I, I think there's value even in that technical footnote, which is to say that the service break point illustrates what we think is the correct view of things and what is true for everyone except retirees. An inactive reservist, Judge Walker, who commits an offense while they are on active duty or in active duty training, but is inactive at the time of his or her arrest, can be activated for the purpose of being tried right, for the offense committed while active, um, right, ditto, right, and so in that respect, like the service break, right, retirees are, from that perspective, simply in a service break, where they might be subject to future recall, although that really is more an illusory specter, as we've suggested in our brief, um, and so if they committed offenses, Judge Walker, while on active service, they can be recalled to be tried for those. The issue is offenses committed in the break, what I'd be interested to hear your reaction to the discussion I was having with Ms. Barmore about deference and um, particularly in response to my invocation of Toth, she said, well, I don't have to worry about Toth because that involves a civilian. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, as you know, Judge Tatel, I mean, we disagree that 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 sort of begs the question to assert that in Toth, the, 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 the accused was a civilian. Um, on the deference point, I mean, I, I just want to be clear. Well, how would you, is, how would you, but that's the way she distinguishes a case. She says, of course, you will defer, the courts have to defer when you're talking about civilians. Uh, I think the question is what but, made, to, what, the, Judge Tito, I think, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, finish. I, 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 I think the question is what made Toth the civilian? Um, was, he, was he a civilian simply because Congress had not deemed him? to be a member of the armed forces, or was he, was he a civilian in function? And, and this, Judge Shadle, goes to, um, I, was, I was a bit surprised that Ms. Barmore brought up the discussion in Guagliardo, um, where at the end, I think it's page 286, um, where the court talks about options available to Congress if it wanted to remedy the jurisdictional defect that the majority was there identifying. Um, the point that the court was making about conscription was not that Congress could turn around and say, a civilian employee like Guagliardo can simply be deemed a member of the armed forces. The point was that he could be conscripted into active service. Um, and that's the exact distinction that we think all of those cases all but say out loud, which is that it's not about the formality of what Congress has said. Okay, and, and one more question about the conversation I was having with her. As a practical matter, if the, if, if it turns out that the military can't treat members of the Fleet Marine Corps uh, as members of the military for, for purposes of uh, court martial, how would the military how would the military handle crimes like the one involved in this case? So I, 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 I'm, I'm glad you, you gave me a chance to, to, to come back to that. I think there are a couple of points worth making here. The first is um, the government represented to the district court, I think quite correctly, that it still has the power to pursue administrative separation, that um, to Judge Walker's concern, it could actually act against a retiree to say you can no longer wear your uniform, you can no longer use your title if you've been convicted of civilian offenses. Um, this court, I'm sure, is familiar with the Hiss Act, um, which, of course, we cite in our brief, which provides for the stripping of benefits, in this case, Mr. Larrabee's retainer pay, um, in circumstances in which an individual has been convicted of particular offenses um, by a civilian court. Um, and so, Judge Tatel, from our perspective, the government has any number of remedies available to it when retired service members behave badly. Um, and what, I'm sorry, about a crime? what about a crime like this? Could he, well, could I, he... I mean, this, I think we've, I mean, we've, as, as your honor's colloquy suggested, we've identified at least two distinct offenses that right. the Justice Department could have pursued um, Mr. Larry before had, had the government 
in our view, correctly held that it couldn't court martial him. You said any number of remedies. The military has any number of, of remedies. Uh, but the, the two you just gave strike me as insufficient to solve the problem. That doesn't matter that I think it's insufficient. I'm not a policymaker. But it, it matters that Congress might have thought them insufficient to solve a problem as big as the problem that, that Ms. Barrymore and I were, were talking about. And if Congress thought the best way to, to solve that problem, to, to uphold the reputation and honor and integrity of the military so that we can have as strong a fighting force as possible, including a fighting force that our, our best potential warriors want to join, if Congress thought the best way to do that is to have this court-martial regime for anyone who wears a uniform ever. Who are we as, as judges to say, well, there are other remedies that, that, that Congress could have done or that the military could have, could have done. They chose this one. So, I mean, I think Judge Walker, as judges, your honors are the same judges who in Toth and Covert and Guagliardo and Grisham um, and Singleton um, did not defer to similar judgments by Congress. And indeed, Judge Walker, in those cases, those judgments actually had been made. I mean, I will just point out, your honor, that the government has never pointed to any suggestion that at any point in time, Congress was worried about that problem in particular. But in Toth and Guagliardo and all those cases, Congress had identified a very specific problem. Um, and the very specific problem Congress had identified was the gap in criminal jurisdiction for American citizens overseas um, and for American citizens who were outside of the military. And Judge Walker, even that gap, which all agreed was a gap, um, wasn't sufficient for the Supreme Court majorities in all six of those cases. And so, you know, I, I understand the court's reluctance to second guess what we might think of as battlefield judgments by Congress. Um, but we are not disputing Congress's power to substantively regulate Mr. Larrabee. We are not disputing the validity of the regulations, the, the administrative regulations he's bound by. We're not disputing that he's subject to recall to active duty at any time. We're disputing that those things by themselves allow Congress to dispense with the safeguards of an Article III trial and of the rights to which Mr. Larrabee would otherwise be entitled under the Fifth and Sixth Amendments. And if I may, Your Honors, I realize we're over time. I'm sorry, Judge Tatel. No, you go ahead. I, just, I, I think it's worth stressing because I don't think this gets said enough. I mean, there are meaningful, significant differences in what a court-martial looks like today and a civilian criminal prosecution. In a court-martial, Mr. Larrabee has no right to unanimous conviction. He has no right to a fair cross-section of jurors. There are substantive offenses that would be constitutionally precluded from civilian trial that the government's allowed to try in a court martial. And so, you know, th these are not the courts martial of old that Justice Black decried as a rough form of justice, but they're still not the civilian courts to which, you know, we, okay. we think the Constitution and Tuskegee are. Let me, oh, let me, no, you go ahead, Judge Ryan. Oh, okay, thank you, you Judge Tittle. Um, yeah, I guess, um, you know, I certainly share some of your concerns that there needs to be some type of of outer boundary, but I am concerned about administrability and where we set that test. And, and so I think your test, for instance, is, is somewhat different than the test the district court articulated below. And it seems there are even other ways that one could articulate a test of you know, how we figure out who is in the land and naval services. So I'm wondering if you could just state maybe clearly you know, what the test is you propose and why you think that I assume you believe that would not lead to administrability problems, um, which so, I think um, is a serious concern. That, yeah, of course, Judge Rao. And, and so just to be clear, our test um, is someone is in the land and naval forces um, for purpose of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14, if they are subject to and able to give orders, plural. Um, that is to say, more than just a recall order, more than because more than just a conscription order, an activation order. But so, so Mr. Vladek, where does that functional test come from? That has to be orders. Like, you know, in this case, you say there's only one order, but your test requires more than one order. I mean, where do we find that test, you know, in the text or structure of the constitution, you know, in, in historical practice, um, where does that test come from? I mean, I think, I think it comes, so of course, textually, right? Article one, section eight, clause 14, just refers to the land and naval forces without fleshing out what it says. 
Um, the grand jury indictment clause refers to cases arising in the land and naval forces. Um, so, you know, those are our two textual hooks. I, I agree, Judge Rao, they don't compel this answer. But if we actually are going to focus on, you know, original understanding in this context, um, it's more than a little relevant, I think, that the founders were deeply distrustful of military tribunals um, and that indeed the founders were very nervous about expansive military jurisdiction. So what about, um, what do you make, I'm glad that you mentioned original meaning, what do you make of the original meaning of the word government in this clause, right? Make rules for the government and regulation. I mean, in some of the research I've done, I mean, government is an incredibly broad term as used at the time of the founding to manage or control. It's something arguably broader than just regulating. Um, and so, so I'm interested to know if you've, if you've looked at that question and how you think that might relate to your argument. Um, I have, although perhaps not as much as your honor. Uh, and I'll just say that, you know, I think the, the term government has been understood, at least historically, to imply that where you have the land and naval forces, the government's power is plenary. Um, that as opposed to, for example, the Commerce Clause or Congress's other more, more uh, specifically enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8, government is a police power, um, much as the Congress exercises over the seat of government, um, much as Congress exercises over public buildings um, and, and Native American reservations. And so, you know, Judge Rao, from that perspective, that to us gets us to Solorio and the deference to which Congress is entitled when regulating those who no one questions um, are in the land and naval forces. It's the boundary question where I think there's no similar historical argument for deference. Um, and indeed where I think it's telling that for all of the times that the Supreme Court has reiterated deference to judgments about the military, every single one of those cases involved active duty personnel. Um, and the government through the briefing in this case, through the parallel briefing in Bagani, has never identified an example of a single case where an appellate court gave deference to Congress's determination with regard to inactive personnel. Well, but I mean, that's why this case is is unique, right? But also, I mean, Mr. Kirby is also not a civilian, which is what was involved in the other right. Of cases, right? You so know, we, I mean, we, we freely concede. We, we don't think this case is controlled um, by either line of precedent, um, which I think runs counter to some of the claims in the government's opening brief. Um, the, the point to us, Your Honors, is between those two polls, um, is not a mushy gray zone with no clarity, right? The point is that Congress activates its authority by defining a class of offenders who Congress believes falls within the term land and naval forces. And the question for the courts is simply whether that determination by Congress is correct. Um, and that's why Judge Rao, the boundary cases I think are not going to arise on a seriatim basis. It's a category by category determination by Congress. If I might take isn't, that, oh, isn't your isn't your point in the boundary cases that we can we can we decide the boundary cases without taking account of Article Three and the Fifth and Sixth Amendments? In other words, doesn't the what I call the toe thumb on the scale calculate uh, play a role in this calculation? In other words, if 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 as you said, uh, neither line no line, neither line of cases controls this, and the case could quote you know, go either way just on the basis of the language that the tiebreaker is Toth and the need to, pre pre to preserve the Article 3, Section 5, uh, Amendment 5 and 6 powers, right? So, Judge, you know, I would say there are two tiebreakers, if you'll indulge me. The, the, the first well, tiebreaker- is one of them? Toth is, is one of them, them? right? The, yeah. And that line of cases. But, but Your Honors, I, I think there's a second tiebreaker that we don't talk about enough in these cases, which is the more general skepticism the Supreme Court has shown toward any departures from Article Three, not just in the military context. I mean, I think, you know, in Stern versus Marshall, the Chief Justice's majority opinion um, went out of its way to suggest that there are reasons why we are very wary of departures from Article Three, even if, unlike in this case, we didn't have concerns about the non-Article Three forum. And so I think there are actually, Judge Tatel, two different pressures, both tilting toward civilian courts in these cases as opposed to courts martial. I ask a question along the lines of Judge Rao's uh, inquiry about original public meaning. Um, Judge Mags's concurrence in Bagani, if I'm remembering right, talks about some founding era cases where furloughed soldiers were court-martialed, even though I, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, they were subject to no orders other than the one order that 
Larrabee is subject to uh, a recall order. Uh, Congress pardoned them, but didn't pardon them on jurisdictional grounds. Can you uh, talk, talk about that? Yeah, I mean, so it, it was just a, f a footnote, Judge Walker, on a matter that wasn't extensively briefed in Bagani. But but if, if from my research, um, where Judge Maz's concurrence, I think, overstates things is in suggesting that furloughed soldiers are analogous to retirees. And here's the key difference. A furlough, as it was understood at the founding, was a temporary leave of absence from a geographic area. It was basically just sort of a temporary suspension of duty, um, which usually had a fixed duration, Judge Walker, a weekend furlough, a, a two week pass, something like that. Um, no one understood furloughs at the time to be changes in the underlying status of the service member. In contrast to retirees, who are not subject to any kind of temporary fluctuations, who are categorically inactive. And Mr. Wattic, it, it sounds like though you're you're shifting from the functionalist argument that you made earlier to now a more formalist article, argument about status. If if we take your functional test, you can be court-martialed if you're subject to more than one order. You cannot be court-martialed if you are subject to only one order. The, these furlough cases are inconsistent with that. Test. So uh, with respect to Walker, I'm not sure they are, because I think that the key is that the status to which I'm referring is not the status at the moment. It's the status. It's your legal status. A furloughed soldier is still in active service legally. Um, and so from that perspective, the, the question again, and this goes back to categories versus cases. The reason why we think the question is the class of individuals as a category is it's whether that class of individuals as a category is generally subject to orders or not to orders. And so the government, for example, points to specific examples of certain active duty personnel who can't give orders, um, right? To us, that misses the point. The question is whether this, the, the class Congress has identified in one of the subsections of Article 2A um, of the UCMJ, is that class of individuals a class that is generally subject to orders? Um, and Judge Walker, that definition gives Congress an awful lot of latitude. Um, if Congress wanted to continue to hold retirees to the UCMJ, it could simply impose upon them regular military responsibilities. Um, I think the, the relevant point that, that I think we haven't spent a lot of time talking about is Congress hasn't touched any of this in over 70 years. I mean, the, the two provisions of Article 2 that Congress has never amended are 2A4, which is retirees, and 2A6, which is the one at issue here. And so the notion that Congress has been sort of steadily updating this as retirees have become more and more anachronistic, as the notion that retirees are going to be the fallback in an emergency has become less and less accurate. You know, that's where I think the, the court's obligation really becomes especially uh, imperative, because otherwise this is jurisdiction in perpetuity by inertia. So let me just, before you sit down, make sure I totally understand your basic argument here. Um, your, your view is that under Toth and Stellario, the question is whether someone is actually a member or part of the armed services and that members of the Fleet Marine Corps are not because they have no military duties and are not subject to any orders, correct? So they are not members or part of the armed services. They're not under section four, under clause 14 of the constitution, part of the naval forces. And that the only order they are subject to, that is cerebral, that's the gateway back to being a member or part of the armed forces. Is that your position? Uh, it is, and, I, and I, I, I'm, you did it in much less than 32 minutes, so <laughs> I should try But that's it. it, right? So your, your, your answer, because I've struggled with this question of how do I think about the, the order to return to active service, because these people are subject to that order, correct? They are, but of course, so Judge Taylor... So you can't say that members of the fleet Marine Corps are not subject to military orders. They are subject to this one, right? But I take but, it your view is, but that they, that order is, well, why don't you answer my question before I do? You so, so I might judge, you know, I, I think that yeah. order is sui generis. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, there has to be some mechanism by which the government can conscript. Um, and so, for example, um, I, as a member of the selective service, am theoretically subject to one order. Um, if Congress were to pass the right statutes to activate the call up of the selective service. Um, that does not mean that because I'm subject to one order in the future, I am today subject to military orders. 
um, I, I don't mean to personalize this, but I think the point is that um, there has to be an on off switch that allows Congress to trigger the body going forward. That order, though, is not something that, first of all, is a realistic specter for the overwhelming majority of retirees. As we point out, over two thirds of retirees are actually categorically ineligible for recall under the government's own criteria. Yeah, but but that, also, that can't be the standard. I mean, if that changes in the future, then no, I mean, of course, that can't and, be the standard. And, it, it, yeah. I don't. I don't mean to get. I don't mean to get I mean, sort of. No, but but isn't your point that I, I just want to make sure I understand it? Because as you could tell from my questioning of, of Ms. Farmer, to me this question is critical. This is a central issue in this case. So your view is is that the the order to return to active duty that's the that's what that's the difference. That's how you go from being quote not being actually a member of the part of the military, becoming an actual member of the military, right? And I take it someone who violated that order would be subject to court martial, right? Yes. And, and, and as we say in the brief, in Billings versus Truesdell yeah. and in the Gwyn case, um, uh, the Lewin case, I'm sorry, the, the courts have said that failure to respond to the order. But Judge Tatel, failure to respond subjects you to court martial, not as an inactive person, but as an active person refusing to acknowledge your active status. And, and if I might take a step back, this is the, I, I, I don't mean to be coy. I mean, this is how the militia works um, and how it worked at the founding. A, a member of the militia was not subject to military orders until the militia was called forth. Um, a member of the National Guard is not subject to military orders until the National Guard is activated. And so I, I just, I, I understand that this is a stumbling block for the court. I just want to suggest that this is a, um, a sort of a ubiquitous um, dividing line in this area. Okay, great. Okay. Well, unless my colleagues have any further questions, do you, Judge Rao, Judge Walker, are you okay? All right, great. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Ms. Barmore, you can have um, three minutes, and I'm going to take up the first 30 seconds of it with two questions. Number one, what's your answer to uh, Mr. Vladek's point? about that he just made about uh, the militia and the National Guard. They are also subject to just one order and they were never considered part of the military until that order was issued. That's question number one. Yes, Your Honor. So the, the militia actually underscore our main argument here because the militia is subject to a unique protection under the Fifth Amendment's grand jury clause exception that applies to the militia, quote, when in actual service, which is distinct from the land and naval forces, where they are exempt from the grand jury clause at all times. And that's what the Supreme Court said in Johnson v. Sayre. So in the Constitution, you have this textual distinction saying that active duty does matter for the militia, but not for the land and naval forces. And that is the interpretation the Supreme Court has adopted. And what's your answer to his uh his hypothetical about the 90 year old Korean war veteran charged with uh, court martial for shoplifting. So you're, I have a couple of responses to the 90 year old mm -hmm. uh, war veteran hypothetical, which is that that just is not this case. The fleet Marine Corps well, Reserve does not, not have this case, 90 year old but we, we know it's not this case. But it's but also the question not. We have to decide the question we have to decide, the question we have to wrestle with in deciding the case are what are its implications? And his position is that if, if, uh, if you're right, then a 90 year old Korean war veteran can be court-martialed for shoplifting. Is that true? So this, this actually gets into the first point that I wanted to make in response. Yeah, just, if you just Let, answer, you so, just say, Right, so my answer to your question is that there really is no need for this court to decide that type of edge case in this case, because this mm -hmm. case only deals with the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve it does not deal with retirees for length of service. So the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve, their members have only been in for 20 to 30 years. After 30 years, which would be the 90 year old Korean War veteran, they're transferred to the retired list. And so while there are many cases recognizing that retirees like that individual would be in the land and naval forces, that case is not presented here because all of those types of concerns are just not at issue in the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve. What about and so this Vladek's hypothetical about uh, Fleet Marine fleet reservist who is court-martialed for criticizing the president. Does your so theory allow for that? So a couple points there, Your Honor. So Article 88 prohibits contemptuous words, not just blanket criticism, but contemptuous words. And okay. 
and Congress has yeah, well, suppose authority. he's contemptuous. Suppose just mm -hmm. let me just if I could, Judge Walker, amend your hypothetical. He criticized the government, the president contemptuously. Absolutely, Your Honor. The the <laughs> UCMJ essays a broader amount of conduct that necessarily is prohibited because of the need to maintain order in the military that is going to be broader than civilian codes. And we do not contest that Congress has that ability under Clause 14 to make rules governing the land and naval forces in a way that ensures obedience and discipline in the chain of command. There are just that unique considerations Marshall, in the military context. So that court martial would be okay? Um, Your Honor, we, we don't contest that the full UCMJ would apply to the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve, which does include Article 88. So that court martial would be okay? Yes, Your Honor, if I understand the hypothetical. And so the second point I would like to make apart from just that this court does not need to decide these edge cases here because the Fleet Marine Corps Reserve satisfies either a formal or a functional test, especially supported by the longstanding historical practice of respect to retirees. Inactive duty is also not a distinction that this court should make for Clause 14 for several reasons. And we've already talked about the Fifth Amendment. I'm sorry, what, what's the, I'm sorry. Could, you, could you just say again, what's the distinction we shouldn't make? I just didn't hear oh, what you said. Between yeah. inactive duty and active duty service members. Oh, I see. That, there, that there's been a lot of discussion about that it might matter that, that Fleet Marine Corps reservists are on inactive duty. But as we just talked about with the Fifth Amendment's exception for the Grand Jury Clause, there is no active duty requirement for the land and naval forces. That's not part of Clause 14's plain meaning, which Solorio highlighted. The Supreme Court in Tyler highlighted that qualified relief from active duty did not change things. And really that gets back to the purpose of Clause 14, which is to have a military that's ready to fight war should they arise. Not necessarily to fight a war today, but Congress's responsibility is to, pre to prepare the nation for future armed conflict. Was and that was there Was there a practice of having um, inactive service members at the time of the founding? So I would point this court to, we discussed a little bit Judge Maggs's concurrence. The Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces recently decided this issue in Begani. He carefully went through the historical record on this point. And the example of furloughed so soldiers, which Judge Walker raised, does provide an example where they were not on active duty. They were allowed to be absent from their regimen, which Judge Maggs recognized meant that they had no actual requirements of doing anything while they were inactive, um, but they could be recalled at any time right after the Revolutionary War because there was a concern that maybe the war wasn't really over. And they were subject to court martial jurisdiction for mutiny, which is a military offense. Um, one last point I would like to make in response to this service break idea that Mr. Vladek raised. In 2016, Congress actually did amend the UCMJ with respect to inactive reservists to extend court martial jurisdiction over this service break period between um, training, inactive training uh, requirements. So for example, if you might go for a weekend and be in training on like a Friday and a Saturday and you were to go out on Friday night and get into trouble, that would be historically considered a break in your service, but Congress decided to extend UCMJ jurisdiction to cover that Friday night period. And so Congress does carefully, you know, amend the UCMJ from time to time to take into account these practical realities. Um, Judge Ronald, Judge Walker, do you have any other questions? Not for me. Okay, Ms. Farmer, Mr. Vladek, thank you for your arguments this morning. The case is submitted. Case number 20-1306, Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association, Petitioner versus Securities and Exchange Commission. Ms. Levine for the petitioner, Mr. Wyman for the respondent. May it please the court, Sarah Levine for the petitioner, SISMA. With the court's permission, I'd like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal. This case involves the SEC's efforts to circumvent the APA by promulgating purportedly temporary but indefinitely extendable substantive regulatory change, 
without using notice and comment. In the order at issue here, the SEC exempted municipal advisors from a statutory requirement to register as broker dealers. Unsurprisingly, given a lack of opportunity for public comment, the SEC's rationale for the 2020 exemption was arbitrary and capricious and supported by substantial and unsupported by substantial evidence. The SEC has tried to shift the focus uh, to disability. Can I, can I ask you to begin with the government's argument that the case is moot? Absolutely, Your Honor. This, this case is not moot for several re reasons. First, it's capable of repetition, but evading review. Evading review, And we know the standard the circuit has set out is that there's a reasonable expectation of the same complaining party will be subject to the same actions, and that the challenge actions is too short in duration to be fully litigated. And here, we more than meet that standard. The SEC has already twice take an action to arbitrarily distinguish between municipal advisors and broker dealers. First in its proposed rule in 2019, and then again in the 2020 action at issue here. In the most recent agency action, the commission explicitly asserted its complete discretion to extend this action as it deems appropriate, essentially unfettered discretion. This circuit has held that an agency's well, refusal Lamine, to admit it, it, the illegality Ms. of its- Ms. Lamine, excuse me. Um, if even if it were, even if we were to think that this was capable of repetition, which, which I'm not certain about, um, why, um, what evidence is there that it would evade review? Because in this instance, you know, the, the agency did a temporary order, but previously it was thinking about doing a permanent order. A permanent order certainly wouldn't um, evade review because once it went into effect, it could be challenged in due course. So, I mean, what evidence is there that, that the agency would do this in a temporary manner again? Yes, Your Honor. So the circuit has held um, and the Supreme Court has recognized that for the purposes of, of this standard, it's less than two years to be fully engaged to the, night, um, to the Supreme Court. And here, let's take the procedural violation, the APA, which we think violates the strict language of the statute, the fact that they issued this order, which constitutes a rule under the APA without notice and comment. This, this circuit has previously held that this same posture, um, a, a, a rule issued without notice and comment is capable of repetition, but evading review in the Safari Club International um, versus Jewel later Zinke cases. And um, this is qu quite a clear, stark violation, right? The plain reading of the statute, 5 U.S.C. 51, tells us that rules are future-oriented, right? A rule means the whole or part of an agency statement of general particular applicability and future effects. So Congress has defined a rule as something that has exclusively future effects. That's what this purported order did here. Um, and we know that this circuit has explained um, this is Safari Club versus Zinke Judge Edwards, that rules generally only have future effects and adjudications immediately by bind parties by retroactively applying. And the, uh, Judge Edwards pointed to Justice Scalia's concurrence in Bowen versus Georgetown University Hospital, stating that the central distinction between a rulemaking and adjudication is that rules have legal consequences only for the, the future, which is what this exemption did. So they styled it in order, but it actually qualifies as a rule under APA, and they issued it without notice and comment. Um, and um, they've taken the position that that's fully appropriate, that that's available to them, that that's effective, and, and that, that that's fully legal. So we take them at their word. They have said that they have um, full discretion to um, initiate this type of what they term an order repeatedly. Um, and um, this circuit in, for example, um, living, in, in prior cases has said that the litigating position um, is, is a factor that needs to be considered for capable of repetition but evading review. This is in Ray um, Center Auto Safety. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Levine, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure that that response goes to the question of why we think the agency would do a temporary order again. You know, even if they chose to act by order, it's not clear that they would choose to act again by temporary order. And so therefore there's not, you know, what's the evidence that it's, um, you know, that it would evade review. Maybe it's capable of repetition because they've said we can act by order instead of rule. Um, but the idea that it would evade review, I I'm just not sure what evidence there is for that. 
Yes, Your Honor. Of course, the circuit has held that a litigant doesn't need to show that the challenge action will always be less than two years. And that's Washington Post versus Robinson, uh, where um, the press sought a uh, sealed um, plea argument. So the standard that we need to make meet is, is there a reasonable expectation that the agency will do this again? And Your Honor, I point to the facts here. Initially, as we know, in 2019, the commission proposed what would have ultimately have been a final rule. But instead of implementing that, we look to the own cho their own choice that they made. They could have completed that rulemaking. Notice and comment had been pending. They could have completed that action. Um, but Judge Rao, what they chose to do instead was issue a, a six month APA rule, which they styled as an order. And their past conduct is what, what gives us the factual basis to have every reasonable expectation, which is the standard. And we point also to Joe V. Sullivan, um, this court's decision, which said there just needs to be some likelihood that it will occur. And that was a case where a soldier had brought um, an APA challenge um, related to a period of time when Desert Storm, um, the military action was in effect. And it essentially faced an argument that the, the war had ended, Desert Storm was over, so it wasn't that moot. And in that case, the circuit explained that some likelihood of recurrence is enough. And, and we've seen other instances for example, Safari Club versus Zinke, where um, the agency had issued the Department of Interior actually didn't even take any steps. It was a change in policy um, that would have affected import licenses for elephant trophies. And in that instance, the circuit recognized it as capable of repetition but evading review. So although from a distance, I think um, it, it's easy to say, well, how do we know what the SCU is gonna do? We look closely at the facts here in terms of what they have done and what the standard is that the, the circuit has defined um, in repeated precedents. And, and we think we more than meet that standard. We, we would point also, um, Your Honor, to um, uh, the voluntary cessation argument, um, which is another pathway for this court to find um, uh, that, that this is not moved. And although the facts are a bit unusual, again, we think a close reading of this circuit's um, precedent um, does show that, that we call for under that mootness exception as well. Here, the SEC elected not to extend the expiration date of the exemption after the litigation began. And this is voluntary cessation because the SEC expressly retained the unrestricted discretion to extend exemption as it deemed appropriate and identified no practical barriers to extension. And again, here, this is an instance where the SEC um, took an action predicated on a market disruption. That's, that's the very sort of first theme and issue that the agency defines in the order, which is the full extent of the administrative record here. And yet the agency itself did not discuss or address or reference any market data. Here, the SEC is the primary market regulator for, the, for municipal securities. Um, the MSRB, which is an SRO, a self-regulating organization under the authority of the SEC, um, provides that data. It's publicly available intermittently. And yet the SEC went forward and took this action, distinguishing um, arbitrarily between municipal advisors and broker dealers with, without even referencing or discussing um, the most core data to that, to that um, marketplace. If the decision to extend a down is in the agency's sole discretion, as they asserted in the face of the order when they said they'll do so as they deem appropriate, um, if it doesn't count as voluntary cessation, it would give agencies and other private par parties really an end run around the very purpose of the voluntary cessation standard. An agency could issue an action, set a deadline, say it's extendable as they see fit. If litigation is pending, they could weigh that as a factor in choosing whether to extend or not. Um, which is, mean, is in um, itself the, the core of all. About the, um, what about the presumption of regularity for public officers that we, that our precedents suggest we must uphold? Yes, Your, yes, Your Honor. Our position is consistent with that. As the commission has said that what they've done here, they view as regular order. They see it as regular order. It's within their core authority to issue, again, what they style as an order, despite the definition in the APA statute that something that is prospective entirely is in fact a rule, do so without notice and comment, um, and, um, 
and that they have every discretion to do so again without, again, addressing any market data as they did here. So we take them at their word. Um, Judge Rao, Judge Walker, any other questions? Not for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Levine. We'll hear from the government. May it please the court. My name is Theodore Wyman and I represent the Securities and Exchange Commission. The petition for review should be denied for several reasons, but the jurisdictional defects are at the top of that list. The petition's moot because it seeks no effectual relief that this court can provide. The order is no longer in effect. The exemption is no longer impacting anyone. And the result SIFMA seeks here is already the status quo. Um, SIFMA argues that there is a reasonable expectation that this will recur because it says that the commission has twice taken action in this, in this, in this arena. Um, one of his examples is simply the action challenged here. And the other one, the commission did not act. It put out a, a, a proposal, it sought notice and comment, and then it said it's expressed, it's expressly that it was declining to act on it at that time. And that hasn't changed as of, as of today. So it's really one instance, the very one under review, that is their example of what the commission might do in the future. Mr. Um, but even, yes, Your Honor. Can you uh, help me think through how to define the challenged action um, with regard to capable of repetition yet evading review, and in particular, the first prong of that capable of repetition? We could define the challenged action here as an order that grants an exemption regarding broker dealer requirements, yes. or we could define the challenged action as a temporary order regarding broker-dealer requirements. Yeah. How, do I, how, how am I supposed to choose? Well, Your Honor, I would look to the statute itself. Um, I, we cited a case in, in the brief where there was a licensing statute that said the license can only be one year. So it was inherent in the actual action that it could, no, could be no longer than a year. Here, we, the commission didn't issue an emergency order. In fact, uh, SIFMA points out very clearly that we don't rely on some sort of process that is inherently time limited. The commission acted under a provision that allows uh, any actions of various lengths of time. Um, so in this case, uh, SIFMA, I think, would have to show that the inherent challenge here, the inherent action that was taken, uh, excuse me, that the action taken would inherently uh, be of a short length or is typical. If, 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 if SIFMA could show that this is something that you know, really just as a matter of practices, the commission just does this and, um, you know, uses uh, a statute in a particular way, perhaps that could satisfy that. But here, but there's that, absolutely no such sewing. Is that sort of, is that kind of, well, tell me if I'm uh, rephrasing your answer in an accurate way. Uh, if, if this had happened five times, 10 times, 15 times, if there had been a temporary order regarding these broker dealer, an exemption from these broker dealer requirements, uh, if there had been a temporary order five, 10, 15 times, then we would think of the, the challenged action that may or may not be uh, capable of repetition as a temporary order. But because this temporary order was the only temporary order uh, of its kind, and uh, the, the statute that allows it uh, also allows non-temporary orders that would not be, um, you know, would not evade review. Uh, we should think of this as the latter. We should think of this as an order granting an exemption, not a temporary order granting an exemption. I think that this court uh, in its reasonable analysis can make that kind of distinction um, on the facts of a case. Um, what we know is that this wasn't inherently uh, a practice that would necessarily evade review. And the commission, there's no demonstrated probability in the past that this has happened. So I think that is something that is a, a dividing line that would work. And I think I'm with you, but I, I just, you, you've used the word inherently a few times. So, and I'm trying to figure out what, 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 what is inherent, what makes something inherently temporary or inherently not temporary. If the SEC does a temporary order a year from now, granting this same exemption, at that point, would you concede that this is a challenged action regarding um, a temporary order that is um, capable of repetition yet evading review? I think at that 
point, there would be certainly an argument on the other side. Um, I don't know that it would be dispositive with two times. I think it would be fact specific. And, and of course, the question then would be, um, is, it, is, it, is, it a, is it recurring? Um, the, the, because the touchstone is, what is, what is being raised in this argument by SIFMA? It's challenging the specifics of the order. A year from now, um, there's no indication that even if they were to show that the commission would issue another temporary exemption, that it would be susceptible to the challenges that it raises here. Um, it's very fact specific as to the market in 2020. Uh, it, well, know, so there I'm, I'm somewhat on board and somewhat not on board. I mean, I, I have a prediction. Uh, at some time in the near future, municipalities will be short on money. And after that happens, at some time in the future after that, they'll be short on money again. So I don't think the, the, the test can be, you know, uh, is, are the conditions that led to this likely to arise again? They, they seem almost, it may not be pandemic related, but they seem almost certain to arise again. Well, I think it would, that, that question would go to what is being raised in the particular case. If, if for example, SIFMA were challenging the ability of, this, of, of the commission to act in this space, deal with municipalities in this way, then perhaps that would be sort of a recurring um, set of factual conditions. But this is a very um, specific order addressing narrow circumstances. Um, and I think there has to be some indication that, this, that, that, that a, an opinion by this court would be useful in resolving even uh, any sort of uh, recurrence that, that is reasonable. Um, because otherwise it would simply be an advisory opinion. And I think that, that is a fact specific question. And in some cases, um, it, you know, it is reasonable to think that an order might happen again. Maybe there's some sort of issue that's, that's specific, but that issue could arise over and over again. And, and that would depend on SIFMA's arguments. But here they're arguing that the commission didn't consider news articles in May of 2020. Um, they're arguing that certain um, conditions, uh, certain restrictions that were in this specific order, but not in the 2019 order. So we've already have a departure in terms of the, 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 the uh, restrictions that, it, that SIFMA challenges that those specific terms would, would occur again. So I think we're far afield from, from the situation in which um, this is reasonably likely to recur in such a way that if this court were to rule on the, the commission's analysis or, or whatever with respect to this particular um, exemption, that it, that it would really be useful um, in a year from now. Um, you know, obviously the, the circumstances of the initial financial issues following um, the COVID crisis with uh, the, the shock budgetary impacts and, and sort of the things that, that guided this order, they, there's simply no, um, no evidence in the record um, that this is something that is reasonably likely to recur under these circumstances. And I think, um, you know, aside from the mootness question, I think standing is another significant jurisdictional defect. And, it, and it's one of really a proof in this case. I think it's, it's important to, to recognize that SIFMA offers no specific evidence as to its members. It offers no um, member declarations, just saying we act in this space when municipal advisors run up against this issue where they can't go any further, they bring brokers in to do this. Um, it would be very simple and SIFMA is uniquely, um, uh, uh, has unique access to this information from its members. And SIFMA doesn't even argue, uh, address the specific circumstances. They treat this as municipal advisors are allowed to compete generally with brokers, but that's just not the case. Brokers can handle money, they can serve as intermediaries, handle securities, find issuers. There's all sorts of services brokers provide. Municipal advisors weren't able to do any of that. They were able to do one thing under the rule, solicit banks in the specific context of these transactions under $20 million and with restrictions on them that brokers wouldn't be subject to in any sort of competition. So they had to show that um, municipal advisors who are representing their municipal issuer customers, they're getting bank financing, they're seeking loans, they're advising, and then, you know, in this crisis, to get more, um, more efficiency, more, more flexibility in that process, the exemption allowed them to not worry about whether the security was going to be structured instead of a loan as a security. Um, and, and so the real question is, in that circumstance, would brokers be brought in? It's not by the nature of the order um, so. There's no regulation requiring a broker to be brought in, and municipal advisors can, can make that communication themselves. Or the structure can simply be structured as a loan. And those are the kind of inefficiencies that the exemption was, was, um, was designed to lift. It was designed to make that process more efficient. It wasn't designed to allow municipal advisors to go out and get more work that brokers would get. 
And again, it's certainly possible that this swung more widely or it affected brokers, but all it required is a declaration or two from SIFMA members just saying we act in this specific space and this affected us. And two rounds of briefing with the motion to dismiss and here, they've been unable to come up with any sort of specific um, argument on this. And I think that's telling on standing. Um, I think the, um, if the court has no further questions, the briefs uh, and the commission's brief adequately addresses the remaining issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Levine, you are out of time, but you can have a minute. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, there's no doctrine of one is not enough, incapable of repetition but evading review. There are multiple cases, Del Monte, single denial of a license, Rawls Corp versus Sifius, there was nothing pending, Safari Club versus Jewel, um, where there was even not one denial of an import um, uh, request, and the court still found capable of repetition but evading review. As Judge Walker predicted, we all know that the municipal markets may face a situation like this, they also, the, the stated reason by the commission was COVID and the pandemic continues. But I would urge the court to separate out to two claims, the substantive APA claim and the procedural APA claim. The procedural APA claim, it violates the statutory text. The APA defines a rule as, as something with future effects. Judge Edwards speaking for, for the court in um, Safari Club versus, um, versus Zinke, uh, clearly defines uh, an order is retroactive. It can also have future effects. But something, an action by the agency which is entirely prospective is a rule. They took this action without notice and comment. They, they pointed in their own brief to multiple orders where they had done that also without notice and comment. There's every reason to think that, it, that every, there's a reasonable expectation that they will take this action again. Um, and finally, I would just note that this order remains, it, it does have continuing effects. Pursuant to the order, um, any um, municipal securities that were issued um, under its guise cannot be transferred to retail investors or publicly for a full year. So that continues to restrict transfer of the securities that issue through December 31st, um, 2021. That's an ongoing, an ongoing. And fundamentally, the commission created a two-tiered regulatory regime. So the broker dealers had to comply with substantial regulations. Was, was yes, that Your Honor? The last argument an argument that was in your briefing? Yes, it is. Continuing. Yes, it is, Your Honor. Yes, it is. And it's ongoing. It continues. There are securities out, out in the public marketplace that cannot be transferred because the order remains in effect pursuant to its own terms. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Levine, Mr. Wyman, thank you both. The case is submitted. This honorable court is now adjourned until Monday, October 25th at 9.30 a.m.